Welcome everyone to ChessLecture.com. This is International Master William Pascal, and I'm presenting my first installment in the best of Bronstein. This is part one. David Bronstein, the absolutely infamous and, and wonderful creative grandmaster that he was, famous perhaps mostly for drawing a match against Bud Vinick for the World Championship 12-12, considered among that list of the greatest players never to become world champion. But he was known as a terrific analyst, a colorful person. And I just thought I'd present some of my favorite games that he played here in a series on chesslecture.com. So enjoy. This is part one. And um, Bronson is playing white. This is against Sabo Laszlo from Hungary. This was played in Moscow, or Moscow 1949. So, of course, Bronstein playing for the Soviet Union and Laszlo Sabo playing for Hungary, which was basically um, under the control of the Soviets in that time in 1949. So Sabo, a world-class player of the highest level, he did not have a great score against Bronstein overall. I think that David was, was significantly plus. So an interesting opening, nonetheless, I'd like to go over with you here. So one of David's favorite openings, E4. E5, Laszlo Black, and uh, and now F4, the King's Gambit. Romantic opening. Very interesting. I think there's something more to the King's Gambit than just the tactical, wild gambit ideas that we associate with it in many cases. There's something about this opening that has a positional basis. If you read some modern treatises on the King's Gambit, you'll see comments from strong grandmasters like Neil MacDonald, I know who wrote a book on this opening, for example, um, saying how really the modern King's Gambit is played in a very positional way. And I think that's something we see here in Bronstein's game. You can't force things too much. You might get a wild attacking game in the King's Gambit, but you have to play and be willing to play a positional game and go with the flow and take what the opponent will give you. After F4, we're undermining the opponent's center. There's a very important strategic basis behind this move. It is not just about tactics, but it's about destroying the enemy center. The price is slightly weakening the white king, obviously, at E1. So without going through all the theory of the king's gambit, we're going to enjoy this game. Probably most critical, of course, is taking on F4. But Sabo played the other very aggressive option here for black, the Falkbeer counter gambit with D5. And after D5, white doesn't really have a choice. We have to play E takes D. Very few other moves are even playable. Perhaps knight f3 is a move, but it's not so good for white. So this is pretty much forced. Beginners out there might might know that after pawn takes e5, we have queen h4 check, and we're going to win this. This rook on h1 with queen takes e4 check takes h1. So that's not a possibility. Again, for the, the newer players out there, e takes d. Black has many choices here. Um, one modern approach that's gained some popularity, I think, recently, is using us as a kind of deferred King's Gambit accepted. So after this d5, we pretend to play the Falk Beer, but then we transpose back to the King's Gambit accepted for black. Um, this is also, I think, quite interesting. It would sidestep some variations, like, for example, pawn takes f4, bishop c4. We don't have to worry about this being a possibility if we play this move order. This sort of fake, fake out um, Falk beer. But after d5, pawn takes d5, that's not Laszlo Sabo's intention here. He goes into the proper Falk beer with e4. Another possibility for black is uh, the move c6 as well. Different version of the Falk beer. Quite interesting. So I think all these moves are playable. The more solid is probably taking on f4, but we're playing in romantic style here, like Morphe, the Falk beer counter gambit, of course, popular in the era of the 1800s. E4 and now D3. This is considered to be the best move for white. Um, one mistake that white can make is to play knight C3 first. Because after knight C3 first, knight to F6, and then we try to destroy the enemy center. A move later with D3, black gets a very strong counterplay in its variation with bishop B4, which, speaking of Morphe, would possibly lead to the very complex gambit, bishop D2, E3. Something that uh, Paul Morphy did actually expose in his own games. This is very complex. I think that Black gets an initiative. I don't know where the theory stands currently, 
But needless to say, Black has sufficient compensation for the sacrificed pawns. So that's another story that did not occur in our game today. We see Bronstein playing d3, Black playing knight to f6, main line of the Falkbeer. And now modern theory likes pawn takes e4. This is, I guess, the gold standard of Falkbeer main line by today's standards. But instead of that, Bronstein plays instead queen e2. And this move to this day remains fully playable. I don't know if it's as good as pawn takes e4 theoretically, but it seems to be problematic for black. There's no easy way to necessarily equalize. But now we have some interesting possibilities. David gave in his notes that he was concerned about the variation with bishop to g4. And this is one of the more aggressive moves that black could play that wasn't played in the game. He said that after bishop g4, he feared knight f3, bishop takes f3, g takes f3, and e3. Another Morphe type of move, like a positional pawn sacrifice to give the pawn up to leave the white pawns doubled. And a very interesting thing here, um, I couldn't find any examples where this has actually been tried in practice. So amazingly, after all these years, this game was played in 1949, Bronstein gave his analysis back at that time, and in, in all that time, this interesting position has actually never occurred. This is just analysis by Bronstein. So surprisingly, I couldn't find any examples where this has actually been tried. It's an interesting position. I think that white probably has some advantage after bishop takes e3, but um, I'm not really convinced that it's that, that, that strong. I mean, it looks like black has a reasonable compensation, as Bronstein did believe. So going back to the game, Sabo doesn't play bishop g4. He instead plays the move here, queen takes d5. And this is perfectly fine. I think it's a good move. But um, instead, I want to suggest, just because we're here, this is not really necessarily connected to this game, but because we're here, I'm going to give you an interesting idea that I, I came up with. I'm not a King's Gambit expert, but I'm looking at the position objectively, and here I found a theoretical novelty that I think is worth a look if you're looking for a new way of playing the Falkbeer against Queen E2. It's interesting that um, there is a variation with bishop to g4, knight f3, and bishop e4, check. This has been played, I could find three examples where this has been played. But after c3, castles, pawn takes e4, it looks like it's not 100% clear. Black has some compensation, the position is very murky, the bishop goes back to c5, but notably this bishop on g4 is not really contributing anything. It looks active. But this pin isn't a big deal, and it seems like after white plays knight to d2, he's able to consolidate his, his extra pawns and, and maintain some kind of advantage, at least one extra pawn. So my suggestion is to try to create a new idea here for black in this line with not queen takes d5, but bishop to b4 check immediately. And this has never, ever been played in any game that I could find. Bishop to b4 check, and I would assume likely c3, and now we castle. And this position seems very interesting, because if you take if you take this bishop on b4 black, it's a massive, massive initiative. So even the computer recommends, for example, pawn takes e4, similar to the last variation I showed. But notice there's no bishop on g4 here. So after bishop c5, we have a different plan available. Bishop c5, now threatening knight takes e4, followed by rook e8. And then white has to protect the e4 pawn, so he virtually has to play knight to d2. And now black has this move, knight to g4. And this is almost forced. I don't see any way around this from this queen e2 on. And after knight g4, knight h3, it appears that black has realistic compensation. I think that this, this is absolutely playable. I would argue that, that Black's position after rook e8, um, it looks very hard for white to really hang on to his pawns and coordinate his position. So a totally new idea uh, for Black here. An independent novelty with five bishops to b4 check, never played before. One final note, though, to be fair, there is another move for white going back that's probably also critical. We have to look at this position with bishop b4 check, bishop d2. And the possible ramifications of the craziest variation ever. 
I just want to share this. Castles. Bishop takes before sacking a full piece and rook e8. Threatening to open up the position with pawn takes d3. Again, totally new position. Now, white basically has to play d4 to avoid the e-file opening. And then bishop g4. White has only one good move. Because queen e3 is met by knight takes d5. Queen e3, knight takes d5. Very strong position for black. Only move now, queen f2. And then e3, queen g3. And this amazing position I analyzed for this video. Black can play queen takes d5, but it doesn't appear clear that he has enough compensation for the pawn after that. There is a fascinating move, knight to c6. And this is where I left off. It looks like knight to c6, you cannot take this knight because of queen takes d4. With crushing threats at d1 and, and also at, at b4, obviously. So, a really fascinating variation, mind-boggling. Knight c6, bishop c3, I thought here we have several possibilities. Taking on d5, or knight e7 is also interesting with bringing the knight to f5, some variation like this. Bishop d3, knight f5, bishop takes f5, bishop takes f5. And even with, with an engine, it doesn't appear that um, the position is, is all that clear. It looks like, yes, white's up a piece, but black has interesting compensation. Certainly in, in a real over-the-board game, it would be very difficult for white here to to keep his composure and maintain in a practical game. So I think a really interesting possibility. But going back to the actual game, queen e2, we have queen takes d5, which is still today played from time to time. Queen takes d5, um, I found several master games featuring this move. There was one where a good friend of mine played black against Alexander Shabalov, another game by Elvest with white, which I think is very critical. So queen takes d5, and there is actually games that follow this exact game. This is, again, the real game, Sabo versus Black here, Sabo against Bronstein from 1949. Queen takes knight to c3, bishop to b4. This is basically the main line. Now bishop to d2, and at this point, bishop takes bishop. Black, I think, isn't really happy to have to make this exchange voluntarily. I think this this is giving white a very small plus. Bishop takes b3, but I don't see a better line. And now bishop g4, this leads to a fourth sequence of exchanges. And I found that this position had been played before Bronstein. In fact, uh, Reiti had played two games against Tarash and, and one other opponent. I believe this exact variation. So it's been known for a long time. Bishop to g4. And here, it's kind of a forcing variation that leads to an end game. So, bishop to g4, and now we have pawn takes e4, and the simplifying sequence, which is computer checked and seems absolutely correct, bishop takes e2, e takes d5, bishop takes f1, and now king takes f1, and now knight takes d5. Now keep in mind that at this time when this game was played, as far as I know, there had never been another game played in this position. Today's players like Elvest and uh, Shabalov and other strong players who subsequently played this variation had the benefit of Bronstein, um, for example, to follow. But at that time, he had basically played a new line that has never been played before against the likes of, of Sabo Laszlo. So knight takes d5, and now bishop takes g7, rook to g8. And now the, the white bishop must move back. And this is what I mean when you play the king's gambit. You have to play in a positional way. And I think you have to take what you can get. And that's exactly what Bronstein does here. He just goes to the flow. He's not trying to force things, but he's taking what he can get. And he's showing his endgame skill on the white side of a king's gambit, leading to a, to a forced endgame basically after 15 moves. So rook to g8. And we get to an interesting moment now. Rook e1 check. There was one game I found in, in the database where I believe the move order was wrong, but th this is played almost universally. Rook e1 check, king to d7, and now rook to d1. This is Bronstein's move. There is another variation here that's very, very interesting that was played by Elvest, I think, in 2000. Uh, Jan here played bishop e5, and after the move f6, now white has the ability to play c4. So there were a couple of games that, that followed this variation, which is really interesting. Um, actually, 
pawn takes e5. I think even the move rook d1 might have been played in one game. Complicated in game here. It seems like white has a very small edge. But going back to the game, Bronstein, rook d1 immediately, and then king to c6. So it's an interesting situation. White has a pawn up temporarily, but the black king is quite active. You might think the black king is in danger. You might be right. But at the same time, it also could play a very active role in this endgame and compensate for the fact that black is temporarily down a pawn. It can also be like an extra piece active in the game. The white king is actually in the way of white connecting the rooks. So this is not that simple. The white pawn on f4 is simply hanging. So let's see how the judgment of, of Bronstein really works out here. Bishop d4, and, and the precision of Bronstein's play is what amazes me. I, I don't think he made really any even inaccuracies in this game played in 1949. Bishop d4, knight takes f4, and now he immediately spotted this tactic, knight to f3. So you cannot take that pawn on g2 with either piece. I mean, obviously, yes, there might be some sort of check with knight e5, but I don't think that's the main point. I mean, the main point is that after knight takes g2, we have rook g1, just simply winning a piece because of the pin. And secondly, you can take with a rook because we can attack the knight here with, with something like bishop to e3. And that's a beautiful variation because this defense doesn't work with g4, knight e5 check, or... If you want to go back to this position, the other try, knight to d5. Here we have rook takes d5. And after king takes d5, king takes g2. So all variations are in white's decisive favor. So you can't take the pawn. And now knight to d7. And here in this position, there is one other game that was played in the 80s, I believe. With a relatively strong player playing black, in fact. And uh, the game was drawn in this position, or a little bit later, Following the same position, White played a very strange move here. Unimproving on Bronstein, unknowingly, I guess, with bishop f2. This is a move I can't really figure out. So, very strange. Bronstein plays g3, and now we just go with the flow. We take an aggressive opening, we play it the best we can, but we get what we can out of it. In this case, a strong bishop, Bobby Fischer would be proud of this bishop. It's stronger than a knight. And then the most important factor that we have the better pawn structure... So Bronstein is able to preserve this, this pawn structure here with g3 and f2. His king is still relatively active for the endgame. Not quite as active as the black king yet, but it can get there. And then most Im importantly is the pawn structure. So you never see a king's gambit where a slight pawn structure weakening costs you the game. g3, knight e6, bishop e3, preserving this piece. Any kind of endgame where you have pawns on both sides of the board... I think the bishop's going to be a superior piece. So, in a vacuum, he could probably allow the piece to be traded, but he decides to preserve it, and hoping that in the endgame, he's going to have pressure, I think particularly along these open files, like the E file and the F file. Watch what happens here. B6 is probably a good move, providing a shelter for the black king to walk back to B7 later on. And now, king G2. This is not going to the center for a reason. If he plays king f2, I think there's a likelihood the knight will come to f6 and really harass the white king. So he would like to go to the center, but I think in this case there's there's actually two reasons why he chooses after b6 Bronstein to play king g2, because of first of all the knight checks, and secondly he wants to keep the f-file open for his king. So here he plays king g2, and now black plays rook e8. An arbitrary move, but a very logical move. I don't really know what to suggest that's necessarily better for black here. I would say white has something like a half pawn advantage between a half pawn and a pawn worth of positional advantage. But rook on a to e8, and now rook f1, and we see he's training on that b file, excuse me, the f file here for white. This is a very unpleasant position, and I don't know exactly how black should proceed slowly. And, and I just don't think he should move his f pawn forward. This is perhaps the most serious mistake of the game, though there was no way to equalize. He plays f5. This is some kind of miscalculation. Black, of course, hoping he could trade off this weak pawn, but there's no way that Bronson is going to allow that. He plays knight h4. And perhaps there was really just some miscalculation. Perhaps Black was thinking he would get 
something going by getting the rook down on the seventh. But if you watch what happens here, now this is a serious problem. There's there's no f4 effectively. He plays knight to g7. I mean, if f4, we simply just take the pawn. And after knight takes f4, rook takes f4, rook e2 check, rook f2, we just come back. And then black is simply down a pawn. Not an easy endgame to win, but nevertheless, terrific chances for white to win. A clear pawn up, knight endgame, usually very decisive. So knight h4 from Bronstein, beautiful place of, placement of the pieces. Knight to g7. This is not what black wanted. I think going into f5, there must have been some sort of miscalculation by Sabo Laszlo. But he does get to exchange rooks, so perhaps he thought that's enough to help him. Maybe liquidate a pawn, or rather a piece from the board. So bishop d4 centralizing, beautiful, beautiful piece. Taking out the defender of the f pawn and dominating the other knight on d7. Absolutely elegant. Rook check, rook f2. So anyway, this is what I thought. Well, Sabo Laszlo figures he eliminates one of the pieces that's pressurizing the f pawn. But at the end of the day, you simply can't defend. So not for long, anyway. Rook takes, king takes, and now here I expected something more active. Black plays this move, knight to e8. He's basically trying to play knight to d6. I would hope that black could play knight e6 in this position. The question would be about knight takes f5. After knight takes f5, rook f8, and now obviously g4. There does not appear to be a way for black to regain this pawn. I mean, you can play h5, we simply play h3. And again, I don't see a clear way for black to win the pawn back. It just looks like he simply lost the pawn and remains in an endgame with with a pawn down, free free running pawn. With a white king to support it on the king side, it looks probably lost for black. But it's going to take very good technique for white to win it. Um, but knight e8 looks passive. The defense is, knight takes f5, rook f8, and then g4, knight d6. This is the idea. Knight takes, rook f8, if g4. Now we have this move, and we can legitimately draw. So, this is the decisive thing. So it's one weakness or another. He does find a crafty way of defending f5. As I said, with the variation, knight takes f5, rook f8, g4. Now black has knight to d6. He should hold on here. There's just not that much left in the position. But this is the thing he missed. He, he just didn't see rook e1. And that's the crushing factor. This rook coming down and the secondary weakness of the second pawn on h7. Really, the whole black position is lined up on the 7th rank, a, a to h7. It's very fundamental and beautiful. And the coordination of the white pieces is astounding. So rook e1, just kind of Capablanca-like, knight d6, and then rook e7. Just a beautiful thing. All the white pieces perfectly placed. I don't see any sort of pawn sacrifice. You're looking for like f4. It just doesn't seem like it works. For example, f4, pawn takes pawn, rook g4, knight to g2. Perhaps black does have some tricks here with the move knight f5. Very complicated. Rook e4, and now king d5. It's possible there are tricks. This really deserves more, more consideration. I haven't looked that deeply at, at this exact position, but there could be some sort of counterplay for black. Um, I didn't see it when I went through the first game. The f4 was enough. According to the engine, there was not enough there, but perhaps there is a way for black to generate some chances. If he can get that f5 square with f4, I guess the best is probably rook takes h7. But again, pawn takes pawn, pawn takes pawn, knight e4 check. Maybe black is, is hanging on. So there, there needs to be more exploration here. But in the actual game, he played knight f8, and this is really a capitulation. You cannot defend passively. This is very important. Knight f8, bishop e5, and again, undermining the pawn on f5. First it was the bishop undermining the knight on g7, the defender. Now the knight went to e8 and d6, and now he's actually coming the other direction to take out the knight on d6. So the ability of the bishop to maneuver to attack g7, now to d6, wherever the knight goes, he finds a way to undermine the pawn on f5. Bishop to e5, knight g6, and now 
there is a small problem. This would work except for the fact that we have bishop takes d6. And if Sabalazlo recaptures on d6 with the king, white's just going to take this pawn on h7. Actually, he also has knight takes f5 check, so there is no there is no hope here. King takes d6, knight takes f5 check, or pawn takes d6. We could choose just simply rook takes h7 with a terrific, terrific endgame chances to win with the extra h pawn passed on, on this file looks, looks devastating. So great, great chances for white. So in the game, Sabalazlo decided to take his chances, giving up the, the two pieces for the rook. And this is what happens now. Knight takes, this is desperation. And uh, Laszlo probably knew that he's lost, but he figured, well, there's some hope that my king can get super active here. And that's what he goes for. So bishop takes e7, king d5. He's going to try to march the king to a monster square at e4 and hope to activate his rook somehow. But if white can maintain the blockade and not allow black to trade pawns with like f4, uh, it just looks like eventually black will get pushed out. So I thought this was excellent in-game technique here. Again, very few inaccuracies in the entire game by Bronstein. Um, king f3, king e6, that's good. He's pushed back, now bishop b4. King not nearly as powerful on e6. Rook d8, looking for that open file. The rook has got that ability to move across the board very quickly. And many times you can, you can actually lose uh, to a powerful rook with the two pieces for the rook, if you're not careful. If that rook can start rampaging. But Bronstein here, very careful, king e2, bringing back his own king to prevent any sort of penetration. King f6, again, the king being forced out of the center. Check, king g5, and now h3, a very important prophylactic move. He cannot allow the king in. This is absolutely essential. Rook e8, check, king f2, rook d8. Now, the only way to invade is on d1. We force the black king back further now. Knight f3, check, and king h5. This is staying to a, to a very staying on a very strange square on h5, but it's it's more active. And perhaps if the knight moves away, he can try something like f4 and coming in here with the king. So staying as far forward as he can, rather than going to g6. Knight to d4. Now king g6 and now knight e6. And this basically results in simplification that you'll see favors white. Knight e6, rook d1, the only active move. And I can't really criticize Sabalazlo's play. I mean, I don't think this endgame could have been held. Knight takes c7, rook there, king f3. This is a useful move he's going to have to play anyway. And finally, rook takes c2. Now, what do we do here? I'm not sure. Knight b5, good move. a6, possible that a5 was a slightly better try. It might have saved a move. I'm not sure. It, it seems like it's, it's a little bit of a better try. But there's this move a6, and this just sort of speeds up the inevitable. Knight c7 attacking a6. Now that pawn has to move. And then a very strong move a4, fixing the pawn on b6. And the problem is when white captures on b6, it's going to be protecting the a4 pawn. So if black tries something like rook c1, rook a1, our knight's going to be landing on b6 and guarding that key pawn at the same time. And the game's just over. So there's nothing that black could do here. I was looking at rook, rook h2. It just simply doesn't do anything. White just plays h4. So I think it's over. Rook c1, knight to d5, rook f1 check like a spike check, king g2. And then he resigned at this point. We're going to lose... Black's going to lose the queen side at the very least. And there's no penetration for the black king. So this is just... I thought a, a just spotless game by Bronstein. Not a romantic game in the classic King's Gambit sense. But just a beautiful, beautiful, almost Capablanca-like game from Bronstein. We'll take a look at more great examples of his play in the future in the series. Thanks again for joining us for the Best of Bronstein. This is part one. This was Bronstein vs. Laszlo Sabo from Moscow, 1949. Again, thanks for joining us here at ChessLecture.com. I'm International Master William Paschal. Bye-bye.